Hello, I'm Johnny Hubbard, Interim Coordinator of Jazz Studies at Jackson State University, Jackson, Mississippi. In this presentation, we will discuss the history and cultural significance of jazz. We will discuss the music, its musicians, and various cultures and styles from the early days of jazz until today. Let's get started. However, let's begin with a more basic question that is challenging to answer. What is jazz? Jazz is America's music. It is improvised art that is made up as it goes along, just like the country that gave it birth. It is a descendant of African and European traditions born in an entirely new world. Some African musical styles emphasize multiple rhythms, performed simultaneously, accompanying short, repeated melodic riffs. European classical music tends to favor a fully developed melody, supported by harmonic accompaniment in the form of a series of chords and performed in a fixed meter. African music is communal, with music often serving specific social functions. European music tends to be performed by individuals with no specific purpose other than for aesthetic enjoyment. African music is traditionally learned orally and passed down from player to player. European music has been written down or notated. The mixture of African and European elements in jazz has resulted in a music that is harmonically and rhythmically sophisticated. It employs improvisation and notated compositional practices. It values personal expression and requires technical skill and precision. Jazz is America's classical music, and it was America's popular music for the first half of the 20th century. Jazz is primarily a blend of African American and European influences. But African Americans created jazz, and the vast majority of the important innovators in jazz have been black. Many of the earliest African influences arrived with the slave trade from West Africa. The roots of jazz are based in the African American experience. Jazz reflects society. Issues such as racism and racial divisiveness are reflected in the world of jazz. Issues of race, gender, and culture are ongoing themes both in the story of jazz and the story of American life. Jazz developed in the Southern United States during the decades directly after the Civil War. Jazz originated in New Orleans with its African, French, and Spanish colonial heritage and its racially mixed and incredibly cultural diverse environment, including African-American, European-American, Spanish-Caribbean, and Creole influences, among others. All New Orleans musicians were exposed to a wide variety of musical styles, such as popular tunes, marches, rags, light opera, hymns and spirituals, and brass band music. The blues, a precursor of jazz, is a form of folk music that can be traced to earlier Southern African American song styles, including work songs, religious songs, and field hollers. Workers picking tobacco or cotton would sing to each other or alone in the fields as a means of communication or simply to pass the time. The syncopated approach in jazz is a contribution of ragtime music, another precursor of jazz that was created by black pianists from the cities of the Midwest. 
Ragtime adopted the traditional multi-part form of marches of the 19th century. Originally, ragtime evolved as an African-American dance music, but the style eventually became extremely popular with the general public during the first decade of the 20th century. In jazz, the melody is often called the head and is generally played at the beginning and the end of a tune. When combined with harmony and rhythm, melodies have an endless variety of aesthetic and emotional qualities. Harmony is the combination of notes to create chords. For example, C, E, and G is a C major chord. The history of Western harmony goes back to ancient Greece and has a long and fascinating evolutionary history. Jazz harmony is a product of this tradition and jazz musicians have added a high level of harmonic sophistication to it. Rhythm is central to all music. In jazz, the rhythm is manipulated to create various types of swing and we can hear many varieties of swing throughout the various jazz eras. The use of polyrhythm is a crucial element in jazz, two or more simultaneous rhythmic patterns. For example, a jazz drummer would generally be playing four separate rhythmic patterns, two with the hands and two with the feet, while often suggesting at least two different meters, such as 4-4 and 6-8, simultaneously. This is a key feature of African music and plays a large role in African American music. Another crucial rhythmic feature in jazz is syncopation, the use of accents that go against the basic meter. Ragtime, one of the precursors to jazz, is rich in syncopation. The art of improvisation is essentially spontaneous composition. Almost the entire jazz repertoire relies upon improvisation as a central element. The art of improvisation is made to look easy by the greatest players, but it requires immense concentration and quick musical and physical reflexes. A special type of improvisation known as collective improvisation was common in early New Orleans jazz ensembles. In the most common approach to this style, the trumpet played the melody in a loose and improvised manner. The clarinet played arpeggios and fast runs, and the trombone provided support for the bass part, simple fills, and tailgate style counter lines, which are melodic lines that complement the melody. Meanwhile, the accompanying instruments such as the banjo or the guitar, the piano, bass, and drums would be more loosely synchronized than the bands that played from written arrangements. Because there were no written parts, the band was said to be collectively improvising an arrangement on the fly. The African-American coordinatist Buddy Bolden is one of early jazz's most mythical figures. He is often referred to as the first important jazz musician. Although no recordings of Bolden have surfaced, those who heard him, including Louis Armstrong, have spoken of his huge, powerful sound on the coordinate. Buddy Bolden invented a beat called the Big Four, whereas the fourth beat of every other measure in a march is accented. On that fourth beat, the bass drum and the cymbal is hit together, giving jazz music a unique lift. This inspires the horn players to play in a swinging fashion with soulful embellishments such as growls, shouts, etc. Freddie Keppert was a Creole coordinatorist who followed in Bolden's footsteps. He traveled widely and helped to bring the New Orleans jazz style to other parts of the country. His band, the 
Creole jazz band had an opportunity to record in 1916, but Keppert is said to have refused to do so. Jack Papa Lane was an important early white band leader in New Orleans, and his bands were training grounds for many future jazz musicians. While Lane's musicians were primarily white, he was also known to have hired light-skinned African Americans and Creoles. Lane's groups played a variety of music that appealed to audiences for a wide range of functions. The all-white original Dixieland Jazz Band was led by trumpeter Nick LaRocca, who had previously played with Papa Lane's band. Going to Chicago in 1916, they were immediately successful and subsequently a year later were playing in New York, where they helped launch a craze for jazz. While the original Dixieland Jazz Band was certainly not the original jazz band, their 1917 hit recording of Liver Stable Blues became the first jazz record and helped bring jazz to the attention of the public beyond those who played and heard the music in New Orleans. Creole of color, pianist, composer, band leader, Ferdinand Jelly Roll Morton is spoken of as one of the very first jazz composers and his ability to blend ragtime, the blues, and the latest New Orleans style of music was important to the development of jazz. Joseph King Oliver began his career in New Orleans, but by 1920, he was leading his own band and touring with it as far away as San Francisco. He opened at Chicago's Lincoln Gardens, a South Side Chicago dance hall, and played there from 1922 to 1924. This group became known as King Oliver's Creole Jazz Band and had an infectious and swinging feel that was perfect for dancing. Oliver was an important early mentor to Louis Armstrong, inviting the young musician to join his band in Chicago. Sidney Bechet was a Creole of color from New Orleans. His sound and improvisational approach were intense, exciting, and emotionally charged. Bache transformed the clarinetist traditional New Orleans jazz role from primarily playing fields in an ensemble to being a lead voice. His early shift from clarinet to soprano saxophone facilitated his transition into a solo performer. Louis Armstrong is among the most influential musicians in jazz, and certainly one of the most important musicians of the 20th century. His playing and singing have influenced performers of virtually all American styles of popular music. In both his trumpet playing and singing, Armstrong's approach to melodic lyricism and rhythmic phrasing has influenced generations of musicians. As a trumpet player, Armstrong had a physical and technical ability that stretched the limits of what was thought possible on the instrument. As a singer, it is hard to imagine how someone with a croggy, rough hearing voice like his could be such an influence. Yet his approach to shaping a melody set a new standard. Here's a timeline of significant events from 1910 to 1930.
now let's talk about the Chicago style of jazz and some players associated with it. Leon Bix Beiderbeck was born in Davenport, Iowa. While an excellent cornet player, he didn't play any virtuosic style in the mode of Louis Armstrong. Beiderbeck primarily played in the cornet's middle register and had a bell-like tone that displayed the character of the solo or passage. Saxophonist Frank Trumbile had a smooth lyrical style and showed new stylistic possibilities and was extremely significant. He influenced future saxophonists such as Lester Young and Benny Carter. The Austin High Gang all went to Austin High School in Chicago and included many Chicago-based musicians who went on to become known as the Chicagoans. Their style of playing became known as Chicago Jazz, a style upon which Beiderbeck and Trumbile were particularly influential. Paul Whiteman led a highly successful dance orchestra in the 1920s and 1930s and continued a successful career through the 1950s. The son of a prominent music teacher, he began his career as a violinist playing with the Denver and San Francisco symphonies. Whiteman was one of the first to attempt to fuse the excitement of improvised jazz and other African-American elements with the compositional approach drawn from European classical music, often referred to as symphonic jazz or concert jazz. Paul Whiteman's music appealed to different listeners than the traditional jazz audience. Earl Father Hines is one of the great pianists in jazz. His groundbreaking style was influential and in leading to a new modern jazz piano style with more emphasis on melodic invention in the right hand, which helped move the stride piano style into the swing era. Lovey Austin and Lil Hardin Armstrong are stellar examples of women who made vital contributions to jazz yet have been largely ignored in discussions of jazz history until recently. While Austin and Harding were not spotlighted like star soloists such as Louis Armstrong and Bix Beiderbeck, both women were talented and important band leaders, arrangers, composers, and promoters. And now, the New York jazz scene. Fletcher Henderson was an early important composer, band leader, pianist in New York City and influenced Duke Ellington's early approach. Henderson was originally inspired by Paul Whiteman's sound and success and had the same ability to recognize, showcase, and develop talented players and arrangers. Tin Pan Alley was the center for popular songwriters and music publishing from the late 19th century until the 1950s and 1960s. The Harlem Renaissance was a literary and artistic movement, primarily from 1920 up until the mid-1930s. A few well-known members of the movement were the writers Langston Hughes and Zora Neale Hurston intellectuals and activists W.E.B. Du Bois, James Weldon Johnson, and Alan Locke. Visual artists Palmer C. Hayden and Laura Willer Waring, and the actor Paul Robeson. New York City's many nightclubs, dance halls, and informal performance spaces encouraged musicians to form their own bands. The demand for musicians and bands from the mid-1920s to the early 1930s were great. Among the most notable band leaders during this period are Benny Carter, Chick Webb, Cab Calloway, and Jimmy Lunsford. The major New York bands produced a group of noteworthy instrumental soloists who would go on to have long and successful careers. Many worked simultaneously with a big band and smaller ensembles and were able to establish themselves as major stars on their own. Two of the most famous instrumentalists are trumpeter Roy Eldridge and saxophonist Coleman Hawkins. 
Harlem produced a piano style referred to as the Harlem style, Harlem stride piano, or simply stride piano. This style developed naturally out of ragtime, and two of the most notable players are James P. Johnson and Art Tatum. A Spanish-Caribbean influence has been present in American music since the 19th century and has been extremely powerful as an influence of popular music in the United States. These musical styles led to the development of Latin jazz and flautist and band leader Alberto Sacaraz is associated with it. Now let's talk about the Kansas City style of jazz. Prior to the beginning of the swing era and continuing through it, the middle of America had a thriving music scene. It included hard swinging bands such as Walter Page's original Blue Devils, Benny Moten's band, Andy Kirk's 12 Clouds of Joy, and most importantly, Count Basie, all of whom had great influence on the swing era. Bands that had an area they were known for touring regularly were called territory bands. Territory bands were based in a town, but that base was far less important than the areas that they toured, which were often quite large. During the 1920s and 1930s, there were thousands of territory bands, both white and black bands, and some all-female bands providing steady work for many musicians. Mary Lou Williams, had a unique and important career as an internationally known female instrumentalist and composer in jazz. Williams was very forward thinking and sympathetic to new trends in jazz, particularly the developing bebop movement. During the mid to late 1940s, she became a mentor to early bebop pioneers such as pianist Thelonious Monk and trumpeter Dizzy Gillespie. Another style that was prominent in Kansas City and the Midwest and Southwest was Boogie Woogie, a rocking and exciting blues piano style that features a constant and aggressively hard driving, rolling, repeating left hand figure. Pete Johnson was a popular fixture in Kansas City and along with vocalist Big Joe Turner helped establish the Barrel House Boogie Woogie style while also pushing it towards a jazz style as well as toward rock and roll. Saxophonist Lester Young gained fame as a featured soloist with the Count Basie Orchestra. The inspired melodic fluidity of Young's playing made him an important precursor to bebop alto saxophonist Charlie Parker and places him as one of jazz's greatest and most important and influential tenor saxophone soloists. The Swing Era. Music for dancing. Big bands played in large ballrooms for dancers and the music had to get them up on their feet. Music with a swing feeling. The rhythm had an easy loping feeling that created rhythmic drive by emphasizing the offbeats, beats two and four in a four-four time. Music performed by big bands divided into two sections, melody instruments, which are trumpets, trombones, and saxophones, and the rhythm section, which consists of the piano, bass, guitar, and drums. Swing era groups. The Depression era saw the rise of a new style of jazz known as big band or swing music. During this period, jazz bands enjoyed great popular success on record, on radio, 
and as attractions at large dance halls that had been built around the country. Many of the most commercially successful bands were led by white musicians, including notably Benny Goodman, Artie Shaw, the Dorsey Brothers, and Glenn Miller. Count Basie and Duke Ellington also prospered thanks to the increased popularity of jazz. All girl bands. For a variety of reasons, the top swing bands were male enclaves. Thanks to new research, we now know that there were plenty of excellent female jazz musicians who were ready, excited, and more than willing to play in jazz bands. So many, in fact, that during the 1930s and 1940s, there were hundreds of all-girl bands. All-girl swing bands tended to be segregated along racial lines. Phil Spitalny's Hour of Charm was a white all-girl band that was one of the best known and most successful. Anna Ray Hudden's Melodias was another successful all-white band. Financially backed by the powerful agent Irvin Mills organization, the Melodias became one of the most popular all-girl bands of the 1930s. The historically black institution Prairie View College in Texas, now known as Prairie View A&M University, sported a well-known dance band, the Prairie View Collegians. This band was decimated by band members being drafted or joining the military. In response, its leader, Will Henry Bennett, created a woman's dance band, the Prairie View Coeds, to play for local dances as well as to perform at local military camps. Founded in 1937, the International Sweethearts of Rhythm was an extremely popular all-girl band. Originally a product of Piney Woods Country Life School, a school for poor and orphan African-American children, the Sweethearts was considered a black band. But the term international refers to the fact that some of the band's players came from mixed ethnic backgrounds and eventually also included two white players. Now let's talk about swing era vocalist. Billie Holiday is the quintessential jazz singer. She has an intimate style best suited for small bands. Her life was challenging in many ways and she seems to communicate this to us through the emotions that imbue her music. Her music combines jazz phrasing and articulation with a profound understanding of the blues. Ella Fitzgerald had an incredible set of vocal skills, including a four octave range, perfect intonation, a tonal quality that could range from light to husky, and an impeccable sense of rhythm. She swung as hard, if not harder, than any instrumentalist in jazz, and her scat singing solos were instrumental gems. She is one of a small group of singers that we would refer to as a musician's musician. Although not originally a big band singer, Nat King Cole rose to fame during the swing era as a result of his piano artistry and his vocal talent. Cole was a terrific jazz pianist, and the arrangements for his trio were neat and slick, yet felt spontaneous and light. He also sang with the trio, and his smooth, richly warm voice with its perfect intonation and wonderfully precise yet relaxed and soft-edged swing, gradually came to the fore as the most popular element of the group's work. It was a novelty number he composed, Straighten Up and Fly Right, and a light blues number, Route 66, that became hits and made him a star. Frank Sinatra was one of the biggest vocal stars of the swing era. He went on to a long career as the standard bearer of American popular song. Influenced by Bing Crosby, Sinatra was initially primarily known for his smooth, lush voice and his emotion-laden performance of romantic ballads. As his career progressed, his command of phrasing, including long line phrases that required great breath control, set the standard for swinging a melody. 
His voice became deeper, stronger, and edgier, and he became a powerful, assured, and charismatic singer and performer. Duke Ellington was one of American music's most important composers and band leaders. His music transcends the swing era, the big band genre, and even the jazz world, as Ellington created a sound, a compositional repertoire, and a musical institution that is unique and vastly influential. In the 1920s, Ellington's band was hired as the house band for the Cotton Club a top Harlem nightclub, one of the numerous Harlem venues with an all-white clientele. Unfortunately, the elaborate shows at the club often catered to African-American racial stereotypes through racist, primitivist imaginary. In 1938, Ellington was introduced to a young composer, arranger, and pianist, Billy Strayhorn, who showed Ellington some of his arrangements and compositions. Ellington asked Strayhorn to join his band early the following year. Strayhorn went on to work as Ellington's arranger and right-hand man for the next 25 years. And until his death in 1967, he was a crucial composing and arranging partner for Ellington. Innovative bassist Jimmy Blanton and tenor saxophonist Ben Webster also joined the Ellington band in 1939. Their tenure inaugurated the Blanton Webster edition of the band, which produced some of his greatest records, including the classics Coco and Concerto for Cootie. While Ellington primarily wrote in short form, he certainly had the ability to write longer works. A tone parallel to Harlem, a 1952 extended work, for example, is a particularly strong composition. This 13 minute, 47 second work is considered to be a premier example of Ellington's more extended compositions that resemble concert or symphonic works. Bebop developed in the early and mid 1940s primarily among younger African-American musicians. Already veterans of swing era dance bands, they favored smaller groups such as quintets that allowed for more solo improvisation than the highly regimented music of the big bands. The birth of bebop is a reaction to racial and economic inequality and presents reasons why these musicians eventually turned away from the more commercial swing styles to experiment with this new music. The decline of the swing era led to fewer jobs and more competition for musicians, and segregation, both in the music business and in society in general, gave an advantage to white musicians. Consequently, young black musicians reacted to this new reality by creating a new space for themselves. They created bebop a new and revolutionary musical genre that focused on the virtuosic improvising soloists. There were numerous musicians who contributed to the creation of this new style. However, saxophonist Charlie Parker and trumpeter Dizzy Gillespie were the leaders of this movement, and it is their names that are most associated with bebop. Charlie Parker had an extraordinary melodic gift and regularly created solos that consisted of long lined melodies, each of which was an elegant improvised composition unto itself. Gillespie's exciting and flashy style complemented Parker's melodic inventiveness, making them a remarkable combination that set the bar extremely high for anyone aspiring to play bebop from the outset. Gillespie's style is marked by an astonishing fleetness in a tremendous range, often sending his solos into the stratosphere of the trumpet's upper register with flurries of high notes while always remaining musically interesting. Two of the most important pianists in the bebop story are Thelonious Monk and Bud Powell. 
Both were involved in the creation of the style from its earliest days. While Monk developed a uniquely angular and distinctive style, Powell modeled his playing off of the complex melodic lines played by horn players such as Parker and Gillespie. Bebop is primarily a small group music, but its innovators were generally players from the big band tradition, and the compositional opportunities along with the power of the big band still spoke to them. Dizzy Gillespie led an exciting big band. Also, beginning in the mid-1940s, many swing bands incorporated the bebop aesthetic into their music, including those of Cab Calloway, Earl Hines and Billy Eckstein, along with many white bands including Claude Thornhill, Boyd Rayburn, and Woody Herman. During the 1950s, the jazz world opened wide. No longer could jazz be put easily into categories such as swing or bebop. The music began to show multiple influences, and while labels were still applied, musicians began to feel freer to broaden their scope. Consequently, there were numerous styles in the 1950s that were representative of the era and this more open aesthetic. Plus, these styles did not develop in neat chronological order, each one replacing the one that came before. In fact, cool jazz, hard bop and progressive jazz were all developing through the 1940s, embracing both swing and bebop while also bringing new influences to the music. Related styles including West Coast jazz and third stream music also came to the fore. Composers and arrangers in these styles managed to smoothly integrate solos into the fabric of the compositions, creating a balance between the two. The lines between these styles are often unclear. Also, Latin dance music, in this case mambo, continued to be an important part of the scene with the ongoing vibrant flow of influence back and forth between jazz and Latin styles. Hard bop is a style with more of a hard edge and is generally associated with East Coast musicians setting up an interesting contrast with the West Coast style. Many of today's jazz standards come from the repertoire of three quintessential hard bop groups. Art Blakey's Jazz Messengers, the Horace Silver Quintet, and the Clifford Brown Max Roach Quintet. Soul jazz draws on the funky, soulful approach seen in the music of Horace Silver and Art Blakey. Musicians such as organist Shirley Scott and Jimmy Smith, guitarist Wes Montgomery, pianist Les McCann and Ramsey Lewis, and alto saxophonist Julian Cannonball Adderley all added a blues, gospel, soul, and R&B accent to their music that embraced the appeal of black popular music. The 1950s and 1960s saw the rise of small group combos playing Latin jazz. Small groups were, of course, already common in both jazz and Latin music. Several players rose from the ranks of side musicians in both jazz and Latin music to become popular band leaders, including vibraphonist Kyle Taser, Congueros Mongo Santa Maria, and Ray Barreto and pianist Eddie Palmieri. While the various jazz styles we've discussed are being explored, the 1950s and 1960s also saw the rise of a number of musicians who were challenging the status quo of jazz with new approaches to improvisation, composition, group interaction, and the role of the rhythm section. This experimentation was referred to in several ways, among them being the new thing, free jazz, and avant-garde, a term that refers to those artists who hope to free themselves and their art from accepted tradition. Pianist-composer Cecil Taylor and alto-saxophonist-composer Ornette Coleman 
are considered the most important musicians of the jazz avant-garde of the 1950s and 1960s, and both eventually came to be acknowledged as hugely influential in jazz. There are a number of remarkably important jazz artists whose work cannot be confined to a category or a particular period. This is also the case for the five musicians discussed here. Miles Davis, John Coltrane, Charles Mingus, Bill Evans, and Herbie Hancock. Their careers have been marked by constant evolution that helped them move through a number of styles and bands while also shaping modern jazz. Miles Davis stands out as one of the few musicians in any genre of music who was an innovator in several different musical styles, beginning with playing bebop with Charlie Parker, to being a leader of the cool jazz movement, to hard bop, to modal jazz, and then on to fusion. John Coltrane set the standard for modern saxophone playing. Charles Mingus was an innovator on the bass and is one of jazz's most important composers and band leaders. Bill Evans' stylistic and harmonic approach to the piano has been one of the greatest influences on modern jazz pianists. His approach to the standard jazz trio changed the way this type of group functioned. Finally, Herbie Hancock has become one of the standard bearers for contemporary pianists. He continues to be involved in many streams of jazz while also pushing the envelope stylistically and through his use of electronics. During the late 1960s and early 1970s, many younger jazz musicians were influenced by popular music styles, including rock, R&B, and funk. Miles Davis, while controversial in jazz circles, inspired others in a new musical style called jazz fusion. Fusion itself is a broad term that encompasses many different musicians and bands. Each had a unique approach to their music in general, however, jazz fusion bands used electronic instruments, including electric pianos and synthesizers, electric guitars and electric basses. While amplified guitars had been used by earlier jazz players, fusion musicians incorporated rock techniques, including feedback and effects that hadn't been heard previously in jazz. A reaction to fusion and free jazz, however, came from some musicians, critics, and scholars who felt strongly that jazz was losing touch with its roots, as well as its identity as an African American music. They believed that jazz should maintain its strong connections to the past, implying that certain styles in jazz were more respectful of the jazz tradition and consequently more valuable and important. The young and extremely talented and skilled trumpeter Wynton Marsalis became the de facto leader of this movement, sometimes referred to as neoclassical or neo-traditional, in reference to the notion of looking to the classic jazz of the past to confirm important values for contemporary jazz. While some generalizations are impossible to make about today's music, there are some traits that distinguish it from jazz in earlier periods. Contemporary jazz players are required to be fluent in what are sometimes referred to as odd time signatures or time signatures that have an odd number of beats. In addition, compositions may and often do change meter regularly, a characteristic that changes the listening process as it can defy our expectations. This is an important element in numerous cultures around the world and musicians have been studying these traditions for many years. While improvisation is still the lifeblood of jazz, composition is playing a crucial role in contemporary jazz. Composers, instrumentalists, and band leaders are challenging themselves through the creation of new improvisational forms and unique sonic environments 
making jazz composition difficult to characterize. European composers and performers have brought a unique compositional dimension to jazz for many years, and big band writing is thriving internationally. This concludes the presentation on the history and cultural significance of jazz. Jazz education is important for young and old minds alike, and I truly hope that this information is important to those who are listening. On behalf of Jackson State University and the Department of Music, I hope you are inspired to adopt an open attitude, not only to jazz, but to all styles of music.